Brands on Brands. What's up, everyone? This week, we're talking to Joe Pulizzi, founder of Content Marketing World, author of Content Inc. and other books. Check it out. In a world where content is king and your reputation is your brand, how do you build a brand that matters? Welcome to Brands on Brands, a home for those that think different and push their boundaries. This is where branding that matters lives. Now, here is your host, Brandon Berkmeyer. Hey, 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 what's up? Welcome to Brands on Brands. I'm Brandon Berkmeyer, your personal branding coach. And today we are talking to Joe Pulizzi. He is the founder of multiple startups, including content creator education site called The Tilt, as well as the event Content Entrepreneur Expo. And he's a best-selling author of seven books, including Content Inc. and the book Epic Content Marketing, which was named a must-read business book by Fortune Magazine. Joe is best known for his work in content marketing, first using the term in 2001, then launching Content Marketing Institute and the Content Marketing World event. Later in 2014, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Content Council. He successfully exited the Content Marketing Institute in 2016 and has two weekly podcasts that you can check out today. One is the Motivational Content Inc. podcast, and the other is the award-winning content news and analysis show called This Old Marketing with Robert Rose. Uh, Joe, if you don't know, is also has his own foundation, his own charity that is called The Orange Effect. It delivers speech therapy and technology services to over 350 children in 37 states. Good guy all around, and we have lots of knowledge to share with you guys today all about how to use content marketing to build your own creator business and more. Without further ado, let's get going. Brands on Brands. All right, let's get going. I'm excited to welcome our guest today, Joe Polizzi, to the show. First off, Joe, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's about time. I've been waiting for my invitation. Oh, know, you've been waiting. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I know. Thank yeah. you. Finally, we made it happen. I'm sure it's I was fantastic. on your radar. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, you're hard to miss in person too, because you're a lot taller than I am. So that is true. I have to stand up by wearing orange. You just have to stand. I just have to stand. I, well, yeah. I was just listening to I was listening to your interview on another podcast, the Marketing Book Podcast, from a while ago, and. The funny thing to me is he talked about you competing with Mark Schaefer for the amount of books Mark has written and how amount of times he showed up on the podcast. Yep. And Mark was one of the like early guests on this show and he's only been on the show once. So I'm like, I can, that's an easy one to top. If I can All right. Get... Oh, I'm already feeling good. But first off, he he already has the jump on me. Oh yeah. So I know. There's that. Oh, he says <laughs> that Mark Schaefer. He's, sneaky. he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's sneaky. He's everywhere. He's like, he's like, is that Roy Kent? He's yeah. here, he's there, he's everywhere. Exactly. Why can't? Jeez, exactly. A little, can Ted Lasso, <laughs> a little Ted Lasso reference here to get us started. Oh, man. I was an early, I was into Ted Lasso before it was Ted Lasso. Like the, the first, I think right when it dropped, I was there because I wanted to see because I remember the skits that he was doing back in the day. But yeah, I digress. No, it's okay. I mean, it's just, it's great content. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. That's why I'm excited to talk to you. This show is is started because of content marketing. And when I started to, you know, think about like who should be on this show to really talk about this, it was you and I am, yeah, I have let the ball drop and not reach out to you. But the reason I think I want just to preface this is I like to try to meet people in person and get around them so that the invitation isn't fully cold. So we got to meet at a conference that you started, Content Marketing World, where that you built and got to meet you in person. And I was like, great, now that this has happened, please, like, let's make this happen. Let's come on the show. So thank you for being here today. And let's talk about content marketing. I'll set the stage here. Yeah. It seems like more people than ever are getting more comfortable with creating content. It's now, I don't think, odd or strange, but I'd love to set the stage with what is the value to you of creating content? Why does it matter? Well, how are you going to get someone to trust you like you feel comfortable enough with you to buy something from you. I mean, it's, I mean, everyone knows how hard is it to cold call somebody? How hard is it? Just, you just mentioned it. How hard is it 
to get somebody on. I mean, we actually, we had a really good conversation. We happened to run into each other at content marketing world, but what are other ways that it could, I could have been looking at your, reading your blog posts, listening to your podcasts. I mean, that's, it's funny how things work. I, w- I was never a Nate. I think it's Nate Bargatze is the comedian. I was never a fan of Nate's. And then for some reason in my, in my reels, I was seeing Nate's little stand up, and I started to say, oh, that's really funny. And then I, you know, then I watched two of his Netflix specials. So easy. And we all get that, right? All, so let's take that to our business. Okay. We want somebody to buy our stuff. Well, that process needs to start months, if not years in advance. And I, a spouse to the belief that Brian Clark taught me when you know we were getting started in the mid 2000s he basically said my whole goal is not to sell them anything for 9 months 12 months all i want to do is get them to subscribe to my stuff if they subscribe to my stuff and they can become a long term reader of what i'm trying to teach them about selling them will be extremely easy and we as marketers it's difficult because we want to get to the sale as quickly as possible because we've got financial people and salespeople that are saying, well, okay, I will, that blog post isn't working. This is not working. And that's the downfall of content marketing. It takes time. I always tell people if they want to get in and say, hey, I want to get into content marketing. You made me a believer. I got six months. What can I do? I always say nothing. You should not do anything. If you're only going to do this for six months, content marketing is not a campaign. This is a marathon, not a sprint. I can use all the all the different terms if you want to. That's where if you want to break free of of all the clutter that's going on in content marketing, plan to do it for years. You won't see much in the first nine months, 12 months. And that's where CMOs get upset. They get frustrated. They want to say, that's supposed to be real quick. It's supposed to be like, I'm doing an ad and I want to sell something immediately or I'm sending a, you a spam email. Why am I not getting clicks? Say, so, no, this takes time. It takes time. So, I mean, even in my own journey, starting out in 2007, I started to get frustrated in 2008 and 2009. Things weren't working real well from a revenue standpoint, but oh, but I kept with it. And in 2010, the floodgates opened and we went from a $1 million company, you know, basically bleeding red, 1 million in 2010. And then in, in less than five years, we were a $10 million company. And that was nothing but just delivering consistently valuable content to our target audience for a long period of time. And when they had a problem and they just went to us around content marketing, oh, I want to go to a content marketing event. I need some consulting. I need to train my team, whatever it is. We were there because for three or four years, we were the ones that were were teaching them about those processes. So yeah, if you got a lot of money and you want to blast it all over the place, go advertising's great, still works. I mean, you just have to, again, you have to do it seven, eight, nine impressions. I'm sure we've seen the same amount of commercials over and over again. You're like, oh, my God, the amount of money they're spending. And it absolutely does work. But if you don't have an unlimited supply of money and you want to talk about smart, efficient marketing, I love content marketing. It just takes time. Yeah, no, me too. And what's funny is you mentioned Nate Bergatze. And I, I'm i thinking of, so Matt Reif, I discovered the same way. And that's all Nate also. The, the viral videos that launch the discovery of the brand names out there you know matt rife as a comedian was doing the work for years and then a year ago he his crowd work goes viral on tiktok and within a year he's booking world tours that's right and selling out stadiums and i think that viral opportunity is definitely what people are i think what they see and what they chase but what i like about your story that i think is more realistic to process for a lot of us trying to build some type of personal brand based business, a content creator business is that you can't necessarily count on the virality. There's a different way to do this. It's more, I think, process oriented. So if we can talk about the process of building a content business, but for a creator, I know you do a lot of this for organizations and for, you know, big companies and embedding into them, but for the, for the person out there that is trying to be the expert in their field. What is that process? Knowing that virality is kind of like trying to catch a leaf in the wind. Well, first of all, a viral piece of content can happen. It generally happens after a thousand, two thousand, five thousand pieces of content. 
and you'll, you'll get it. We all get it someday. I've had a couple that just go crazy, but it happened after five years of delivering. So let's put it out there. If that's what you're after, you'll, you'll absolutely get it, but you'll have to put the work in first. It doesn't just happen like the two examples you're talking about. I mean, the, the one Nate video that I looked at was some from something like 2017. So it just happened to make a round again and, and whatever. So basically when 2014, 2015 came along, I started to write down my process for how we built content marketing and student content marketing world. So that book became Content Inc. And I went back and then I talked to a bunch of content entrepreneurs and said, how did you make it work? So I know how I made it work. How did you make it work? And I started to find the same trends and processes over and over and over again. So I'll talk about a few of those and then we can break it down if you want to. But the, the most important thing when you get started is you have to figure out what your content tilt is. So your content tilt is that area of differentiation that you need to find to break through all that clutter. You have one. I hopefully have one. I mean, right now, if you're listening, I'm wearing orange. That's one of the ways that I differentiate from other people. Is it in your tone? Is it in the type of content? Is it in the audience that you're targeting? How are you going to differentiate niche down so that you can be somebody's answer to their question on an ongoing basis? So we we call that the content tilt. So yeah, we can talk about all the things like, okay, who's the target audience and what am I uniquely qualified to teach on? And that's generally called a sweet spot, but you have to take it a next level. That next level is, it's not good enough. I have to differentiate in some way because there's more content out there than anything else. So how are we going to break through? I think that point of differentiation is something to, to double click on for a sec, because I've met, I go to a lot of podcast conferences, a lot of social media conferences, blog conferences, and there's a lot of people that started and and they've maybe been going for a year, two years, three years even, and they still haven't found a pickup. They've got, a, you know, a, I think podcasters specifically have their show. It's been out hundred episodes, still haven't seen yep. any reasonable lift in, in listenership or people have written blogs. They're just not getting found. I think that the tilt that you mentioned could be the answer for a lot of them. Um, but why do you think a lot of people who are creating content aren't being found? There's two reasons why, for the most part, and this goes with big organizations or small. It's one, they stop delivering. They don't deliver consistently or they stop delivering. And and the other one is they have no differentiation that that attracts at least a small fan base to start with. And that's what we all need. The third thing, which is the which is leads you from the content tilt on, is where are you going to build your base? Most content entrepreneurs, content creators that we're talking about right now, they come up with some concept, whatever it is. They're, they're, uh, they're selling sales software. They're, uh, they're gardeners. So whatever, whatever they are, whatever they're selling. And they blast it into whatever channels that they have at their disposal. They say, okay, we're going to go on X here. We're going to do some Instagram stuff, Facebook I'm going to be on LinkedIn. Uh, let's, I'll do some webinars over here. Then I'm going to start a podcast, then my email newsletter. Then I'm going to try this little research project and whatever, right? The average company does that 13 to 17 different ways. The average smaller uh, creator, probably between four and eight, but you have to choose one. So we call this the base. Now, it doesn't mean you can't market using a lot of those things, but you have to be found in one location. So what what's your content home? Is it your email newsletter? Is it your podcast? Is it an in-person event like Content Marketing World? Like, what is it? What's the thing that's going to attract people and resonate with them? And then once you do all that and you build what we call a minimum viable audience, then you can go and diversify into all those areas. And the reason why, and the, the, when we did all this research, I started this in 14 and 15, and, did, and it still holds true today. We looked at it and said, oh my God, this is just like, this is just like how media companies start. So look at any major media company on the planet right now and how they've started, whether they started 100 years ago, like New York Times, or whether it's 20 years ago, like Huffington Post or whatever, they all start with a base. It's either, oh, we're going to start with a print magazine or a print newspaper or a one blog to some, or, an, or an email newsletter like Morning Brew. It's always one. Now look at Morning Brew today. Morning Brew started with their daily email newsletter. And then now they've got in-person events and they got 17 different pies and they have diversified, but they didn't to start with. They just did one thing well. And the whole point is you cannot be jack of all trades, master of none. You cannot boil the ocean here. 
You have to pick one and be great at one because that's enough. That's hard enough to do that. So that's what I would say. If, if anybody's listening to this, it's two things. It's what is that quirky? I mean, we can lean into you here. What makes you different? And at the same time, what is that pain point of your audience? And I love to go as niche as possible. You cannot go too niche. It's like if you somebody says, talk to somebody at Content Marketing World, speak of that. And they were having trouble getting found. And they're like, I'm like, what do you talk about? I said, well, I, I talk about content marketing. I said, content marketing to who? I, I talked to content marketing to marketing professionals. Okay, you and 17,000 other people <laughs> and 16,000 of those have more budget than you. So how are you going to break through? You have to be unbelievable, amazing, one of a kind in order to build any audience doing anything. So we have to break it down. And it can't just be content marketing. It has to be something about that. And it can't just be marketing and professionals. It has to be marketing professionals in smaller companies or larger companies or in the Pacific Northwest or, what you know, keep breaking it down so that you get to a small enough group of people in your audience that you can say, yes, if I take this topic to this group of people, if I do the work, I can be the leading expert in the world in that area. And that's a daunting question, but that's why you have to break it down so much so that you can answer, yes, if we did the work, I could be. And that's where, I mean, that's where we focused on with, with Content Marketing Institute. And when I started off in content marketing, I said, well, if, if we had to make our pivot because we were just doing, this is back in 2010, 2011, I said, okay, we're teaching the strategies of content marketing to marketing professionals. And then I, I kept writing that down. And I said, that's not niche enough. You know why? Because HubSpot's eating my lunch right now with inbound marketing because they're focusing on basically all or smaller. They were focusing on smaller practitioners. And I said, well, what if we just targeted enterprises, the big, big companies, complex content issues at the time? Nobody was really focusing on that. I said, that's it. We can be the leading experts in the world on that. And that's when our fortunes changed. So there you go. I'd love to dig into that because, yeah, I thought, so I heard that, I mean, I, I listened to that part of your story and I thought picking the niche was interesting enough. Sure. Like speaking to people in organizations that are like the, that's their job. They're the content marketer in their organization. They don't have a community to go to, to learn this stuff, to practice it. But I guess the question becomes, say you identify that, how did you bring people into the platform that you chose, right? You, you know, you have the the blog content and the email newsletter primarily. And I'm not sure if you had events going at that time, but what was the, like the hook that <laughs> reeled them in to have these people start to find you? So we did, we did a daily blog, basically Monday through Friday, five times a week, focusing on the how-to of content marketing. I had a rolling list. It changes. So it's a little bit different now because Search engine optimization still plays a key role, but it, we're sort of in flux with AI and what's going on. But at the time, I had a rolling list of between 40 and 60 keywords. And I looked at those and I was like, okay, well, what are people looking for? What are they searching for? What's our audience searching for when they have a problem and they want an answer? And I mean, I talked to how many marketers did we talk to? How many Google searches did we do? How many Google trends lookups did we look at to see, okay, here's the main issues and here's what people are looking for. And when people type that into a search engine, I had to make sure we were there. So for everyone, it's like, oh, okay, well, th we want, um, there's there's somebody talking about uh, how do you launch a, a newsletter at a corporate environment or whatever it was. I'm like, okay, well, the corporate newsletter. Okay. Where are we? Is that something that's important to us? Do we have to have a piece of content? Yes, we do. Okay. How do we leverage that? So that all came together. The second thing that came together, I said, well, what we can really do because I've been building these relationships. What if we may had our customers as part of the content? So how does that work? That's very difficult to do that. But I said, you know what? What if we had guest blog posts, but we didn't have it from the regulars? We actually went out to people doing the work. So we did that and we put that in the process. That's a, as you know, that's a lot of editing work to make sure that happens. But we, we built them in because we felt once those people actually became part of the content, they'd be way more likely to do more things like go to our webinars and go to our events, which is where we made our money. So I do those types of things. 
and by the way, just so you know, when we started in 2007, it was just the blog. That was our base. And just what we talked about before, we weren't trying to be great at everything. We're like, okay, we know that we can put the best daily content out here on the how-to of content marketing and just did that and did that, did that. Started in April of 2007. And I didn't think, I mean, when did I really believe that we had something? It was probably mid-2010. And when did I know I wasn't going to have to go get another job somewhere else? It was a year later in September 2011, and that was the first content marketing world. So four years. I can tell you for a fact that most people that say that content marketing doesn't work stop way, way before that. They're done. Now, I'm not saying it has to take you four years because we, I mean, we already had like say, in two, three years, I had 30, 40,000 subscribers I mean, to the blog. I mean, things were really working. It was okay. But you have to build in that patience and and make it work. So everything that we did then, I started, we started to build in the audience into our content. So we did top content marketing blogs and build them in somewhere. Like, Who are they? Whatever. We did research programs where we inserted them so that we could we could get their take on our research and does this make sense and have them fill it out. So that was a, that was a big key. And a lot of people don't do that. So you say, OK, well, who's my audience and how do I make them part of my content? It's not easy to do, but that's one of the things that we did. So and then it goes. I mean, there's if you talk about content that's been out there for a while, there is a piece of content called what is content marketing? If you type in what is content marketing, you will go to a page on Content Marketing Institute. That page still gets 570, 750 people a day to just that one article. I wrote that article in 2007. So you talk about how it builds upon itself. And once you get rolling, I mean, that's that. So you have to get to that point. Once we got to 30,000 subscribers, we went quickly to 100,000 subscribers and then quickly to 200,000 subscribers. But it was that first 10. 20,000 that were the most difficult. I, I love that idea. I don't think a lot of people think about that, especially these days with the new media that's a little more shiny. The Even like the podcasting, the YouTubing, and then the short form video, the idea of bringing, because a lot of shows bring people on, they have guests, they have, but with having people write something for your website, I think there's more room to invite more people as opposed to producing a podcast, which takes a lot of editing or a YouTube video, which takes a lot of editing and even posting it. I like the idea of the customers being participating in the content themselves or the the audience participating in the content themselves. I don't think a lot of people would have thought that about that, especially in terms of community building. But if they're practitioners, I like that, that all pick comes down to what niche you pick. So I think that yeah. you picked a niche where they could do that. I think that's super interesting too. I'm curious though, because I think it's, easy for people who have done it 10 years ago to say, do it this way. Like I I meet a lot of podcasters who say, well, just start a podcast and keep doing it because they did it 10 years ago when they caught the wave at the right time. So I'm curious. And it's so you used to put your, like, you know, your thinking hat on because, because I'm old. Well, because you have an audience. Well, well, not that, not that because you have an audience that you can transfer. So you have an unfair advantage. You have an audience that knows you already that when you're starting the content creator tilt, if you will, you already have a built-in thing. But if you were starting from scratch without the audience, you have a recognition you have, and that was your, your audience today, knowing that like podcasts are not new anymore. Blogs are maybe harder to compete with than, than they were before. Where would you go? Is it still website newsletters? Where would you start? So if you're an individual content creator, I always feel like unless you want to kill your business model in the future, you need to have some website. You need to have a website where people can find you. I'm just going to put that out there. So that said, what are you doing? Makes a lot of difference with how you're going to market. Are you doing an email? So what's your base? Is it an email newsletter? If it's an email newsletter, you're going to want to be integrated with a bunch of other email newsletters. If it's a podcast, it's podcast. So I've got two podcasts, Content Inc., and This Old Marketing is the bigger one. So when I'm on I'm on a podcast like this, how am I going to get people to go and say, oh, I'm interested in Joe? I'm not going to say, go download my ebook. I'm going to say, oh, you already listened to podcasts. Go listen to This Old Marketing every Friday, whatever. A blatant pitch, right? But that's the, that is how you work it. So if you are an e, so you're an email newsletter, 
what other email newsletters are out there that your audience is, is opening up and get a part of those. Do your guest posts for them. Do barter swaps. I mean, that's why these creator networks are, are killing it right now because they're all email newsletters and people then recommend other email newsletters that are interesting to them. And then they sort of grow and the flywheel and the whole thing. So same thing with YouTube. YouTube creators, YouTubers are amazing at this because how did YouTubers like MatPat is a really good example. MatPat is a very popular gaming YouTuber, has uh, game theory and food theory. Well, how did MatPat become super popular? He started to do guest intros and guest appearances on other gaming YouTube channels. That's it. So just think about what you do. Okay, I do the newsletter. So it's so old school, right? Okay, what other newsletters? Write them down. You should have 20 or 30. It shouldn't take you that long. You probably already know. Them. If you don't, go find out. Say, okay, how can I partner with 10 of these? So this November, this December, January, or next year, next quarter, I'm going to make a goal of partnering with 10 of those and whatever that is and help each other out. That's really it. I mean, it's not rocket science. Then you then you get your little minimum viable audience and then it'll start work itself through referrals. And whether that's a podcast and whether that's a newsletter or whether that's a blog or whatever, it all works the same way. That said, when I started and it's still relevant today and it still works really well. Now I'm on your podcast guesting. Hopefully maybe somebody will say, hey, I want to do that. I'm going to buy Content Inc. Or I'm going to go to this old marketing. So whoever's listening to this, you need to do the same things. When I started in 07, to, I counted it at one point because it was for the book. From 07 to 2010, I was on something like 175 different webinars being the guest. And I do all the work and do the PowerPoint presentation. And it was not easy. And it took a lot of time. And I thought I was wasting my time in a lot of cases. But then I realized how much audience I was building because I was stealing other people's audience. So it's sharing, a, it's a, sharing. Yeah, you well, I put stealing because it's, <laughs> you know, it's fun. Yeah, right. I mean, and so it, and it goes both ways. You and I are doing this right now. So here's what's going to happen. Somebody's listening. Some audience member is going to listen to you and either say, Joe's a jerk. I don't like what he has to say. Or Joe's interesting. I'm going to follow him. And then I'm going to, you're going to send me a bunch of links to stuff and I'm going to share it out to my social and said, I had a great time talking to Brandon on this podcast. We talked about these three things. Check it out. They're going to listen to you and say, I really like the way Brandon interviews. I'm going to check out. Brandon's working on a book. I'm going to, I think I'm going to check that out. It all works really well together because we know the game we're playing. So anybody listening to this, that's the game. Coopetition, but then, you know, but we all know we're, we're taking each other's audience, but there's room to grow from that standpoint. You can listen to more than one thing at a time. You can read more than one thing at a time. So that that's what I would look at. So just simplify it. Email newsletter to email newsletter, blog to blog, podcast to podcast, YouTube to YouTube. Go out and do that. And that way you don't have to create as much. You don't have to be everywhere because you have a lot of people doing that heavy lifting for you. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I just think we're all competing against getting those three hours back from TV. You know, like, why not? <laughs> if we have somewhere we can steal from, it's there. It's Well, I mean, what is it? Five hours of TV and social media time is now up to five hours in it's North crazy. America. Which yeah. You're like, wow, we are. What are we? This is this is really like big brothers just sucking out our souls. <laughs> but anyway, that's a totally different podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you guys haven't read Epic Content Marketing, the book, there's which I would recommend, check that out. Joe wrote that with Brian Piper. And there is a part in the book where you mention a subscriber hierarchy of the platforms you'd put in order. And at the top of those, the first three, which would align with what we're talking about here, the first one's membership, the second is email newsletter, and the third is print subscribers, and then podcasts is right under that. And then it's like social. A, would you change that order at all? Or are you is that still good in your mind? And then B, I'd love to kind of talk about what you've been building on your new website, because I see like email newsletters right there front and center. But would you change the priorities in terms of subscriber hierarchy? I would say for, for a new content entrepreneur, content creator, I would say email newsletter is probably at the top. Membership is is almost an, an advanced version because most people that create some kind of membership group, they've started with an email newsletter. 
I like print subscribers as totally old school. I'm still pushing print because when somebody subscribes to your print magazine, it's generally for free. And to do that, they give you a lot of information. They might give you buying information. They give you the place that they live. They all that. So you get a lot of data. And a content business model is built on data. So when I look at somebody's business model, uh, if they let's just say that they have a really good YouTube channel and it has 10,000 subscribers. I'm like, okay, what else do they have? Because those 10,000 subscribers aren't theirs. They are renting them from YouTube. YouTube controls them. YouTube controls the algorithm. It controls your access to them. They can take you off the network at any time. By the way, it's not just YouTube. It's Facebook. It's it's mm -hmm. X. It's, and we know we've heard the horror stories, right? Somebody loses their channel. Big misunderstanding or whatever. The point is, is that you can't control any of those things. Well, what can you control? At least as far as I, I mean, we've been talking about this for 20 years now, 20 plus years, and the email newsletter is pretty much held up email as an opt-in email process where you get that little portion of the data, you deliver that value, that's the value exchange, and it works fairly, fairly well. And if you don't have that direct connection, it's very hard to sell things to actually grow your revenue. So you have to start with that data. Uh, so I guess to answer your question, I would absolutely put email newsletters at the top. If you can grow a membership from that, fantastic. I think, who knows, I, I'm terrible at making predictions, but I really believe in the next few years, you're going to see lots of people start delivering print magazines because there's no competition. There's, I mean, I'm thinking about it. I'm, I don't have any... I don't have anything really to sell right now, Brandon. Like I'm just <laughs> doing a lot of things and having fun doing what I like, but I'm, I'm looking at it, man, I, we should just do a magazine because it, nobody's it's six days a week. At least somebody's getting mail and there's nothing good coming in. And wow, if you send something that's relevant and compelling, they're going to read it. So I feel that that's an opportunity. And to do that, you have to get there at least their home information. And yeah, probably more when somebody subscribes. So I, I love that. And then everything else below that, you know, podcast subscribers, eh, I, I, we don't, re we don't really have, we don't know who those people are. Right. We know of them. We know sort of their, how old they are and where they're from, but we don't have that direct opt-in connection. And then all the social stuff is what it is. And I say, use it when you have it. Now I've got 240,000 connections on LinkedIn, but what does that mean? That means great as long as LinkedIn keeps showing my stuff when I post something on LinkedIn, but tomorrow they might not. Or if I do it the wrong, if I include a link, they won't, you know, I have to play by their rules. So it's a little bit different. So let's talk about your newsletter, The Tilt. If anyone wants to go to joepolizzi.com, there's a lot of, you know, that there's a lot you can see on uh, his new website, but it's going to focus you to, hey, there's this newsletter you should be, you should be listening to and checking out. What is the idea behind it? What are you trying to, uh, it's called the orange letter. What are you trying to accomplish? And it seems like there's new energy behind this. So where does that, where's that coming from? When we, my wife and I owned uh, content marketing and Institute content marketing world, we sold in 2016 and stayed on. And so, you know, we, the whole group, the amazing team we had had like 230,000 subscribers. And when we sold, we sold them. Like we, I didn't, they weren't mine anymore. And in 2018, I got the itch again. And I'm like, I'm going to want to do other things. I'm going to want to write more books. And I didn't have, and all I had was my social stuff, which as we just talked about is I've got to convert that to something. And so in 2019, I started something called the random newsletter, which was basically, I was just throwing out my thoughts and I started getting a couple subscribers here and there in the last few months here i've gotten more serious about that and between you know the email and linkedin linkedin newsletter combined you know it's like i don't know 35 40,000 that get it now and i'm like okay it's time to really take this thing seriously so i redid the website and my whole goal is every two weeks with orange letter is to send something out to a content entrepreneur content creator marketer that's a little bit of insight from being around it's kind of a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. And so in the next one, I'm going to talk about the five changes I made with my website because I feel the website in 2024 has to be different than the website in 2015. And so what, are, so those are the types of things that I, that I talk about. So, um, and that's on joepolizzi.com. And then the tilt newsletter, 
that's on the tilt.com, but that's specifically for content creators trying to build a full-time content business. So that's what you'll get with that one. So I believe that any creator, if you have a, here's where I think the opportunity is only do one thing at a time. But when you get to a certain level and you have a business, like we had content marketing, marketing Institute, I wish I would have started my personal email newsletter at that time. I could have leveraged that and said, you know, whatever that was, but then I had to start fresh over again. And uh, so that's what, so the random is now the orange letter trying to share my 20 plus years of feel old of experience (laughs) in this content thing. When content marketing wasn't a thing, when you never said those two words together, that's when I started. Yeah. Now it's, I used to call it, I guess, when I was reading or on your history and your bio, it was custom media is what you're calling it. I'm like, that doesn't even sound right anymore. Like, what is custom media? But content marketing completely rings true. Like things have really Isn't switched. Isn't that crazy? That's yeah. when I, I worked for Penton Custom Media. Yeah. And that's what we did. We went out and did content marketing services. But at the time, they weren't called that. We basically sold custom magazines. But yeah, that was, that was, I, it was funny because it, I, this is how, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm that old. <laughs> but it takes you back. I remember the first time Google came into our offices. It was like 2002. It's like this Google is what what this little, you know, because they wanted to work with our B2B brands and get them to index all that content. And I remember the discussions and the most of it was, no, we don't want to do this. And why are we giving them our content? And then <laughs> here we are today. Yeah. Most of those brands aren't around anymore, but Google is. Exactly. Yeah. Something kind of a pivot here that I thought, would be interesting to talk about is that once you've, you know, you've got, we talked about the newsletter, we've talked about kind of value of blogs, but you also leaned heavily into events and into speaking to a degree. So my question is where do you, where and when, I think when is kind of the more interesting question, but where and when do you think those things come into play when you are going down this road, is it right away? Like, how did it help you? Because an event seems like a lot of work and a lot of investment, especially if you don't have that following yet. But where would you put those in terms of someone getting started, how to use them and when? So the there's, um, there's three legs of the stool that I like to talk about. The one is, what's your online destination? And we've talked about this a lot. Is it your newsletter? Is it a YouTube channel? Is it your podcast? whatever that is, you build that up, you put all the energy behind that. And then what can really accelerate that base is two things. One is, do you have some type of a book project? It does make a huge difference if you're a published author, and it doesn't have to be by a traditional publisher. So I really believe in that is to take if you can take your thoughts and put it into the greatest business card ever created your book, and drop that in front of somebody, it makes a huge difference. And by the way, you get a lot of the next leg of the stool is speaking. So you get a lot of speaking opportunities. I never got asked to do a speaking event. I had to go out there and go after them. I never just got asked to do one until I wrote my first book, Get Contact, Get Customers. That was in 2008. And I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea. You don't realize that sometimes you're not even allowed into the uh, the finalists of speaking unless you have a published book. I know a couple of events that still do that to this day. Okay, do you have a book? Okay, then you can speak at our event. And whether that's discriminatory or not, I don't know, but that's what happens. So whatever you're doing in your base, how do you build that into, okay, this is what I stand for. I'm going to drop that down there. And then that can lead to what are the five to seven places that your customers are going to be at that your subscribers are going to be at, and you want to speak at those events. So that's going to start out by applying to the speaking submission process and going through and doing your best on it and and getting a good video of yourself. Even if you've never spoken before, you get on something like this and talk so people can, because they're not going to have you at their event if they haven't seen you before. So you have to do that. So I'm a huge believer in that. I've spoken at over 400 locations. I love doing it. But what happens after you speak, you get people to subscribe to your stuff if you do a good job. Now, what I would recommend with speaking, too, is what a lot of new speakers do is they'll they send something different into everything. Oh, I'm going to do this one on 
the seven keys to podcasting. I'm going to do this one on the three aspects of AI and newsletters or whatever, which is fine. I mean, you can get to a lot of different places like that, but what you really want to do is work on one and perfect it. So this is the dirty little secret of mine, Brandon, which you may already know because you've seen me speak a couple of times, but I have, I think right now I'm working on the the five unconventional strategies for content marketing. So that's 2023. If you go back to 2008, when I first started, I still have some of, some of the same slides in, believe it or not. it's I've been working on the same presentation for 15 years, which is horrible to say, but it's true. And they're all variations. And I go in and I make them specific to the audience that's going to be there and I do it, but it's basically the same type of presentation. So come up with that presentation concept that is your knockout. And then you can just keep working on it and working on it, working on it and try out different things. And does this joke work? And does this joke work? Just like a stand-up comedian, you've got to work your material. It's very hard to become a really good public speaker when it's different every time. So that's kind of what I would say is if you, part of your marketing plan should be the print publication, the book, and the the public speaking strategy and start with, again, it's the same thing we talked about, about building your base. Where are your customers at? Where are your subscribers at? Okay, go to those events and do the things that you were doing and meeting people and whatever, and then and then give your, you the opportunity to be on stage. Like that. Well, and as an example, if people are fearful of that, you called it the five unconventional approaches to content marketing. And you said you've been giving that speech for a long time. Like at some point they're, they're more conventional than they are unconventional, Yeah, but you can still give a speech like that because a lot of the lessons are going to be evergreen in general. And this, it's a matter of how many people are applying these lessons. Well, the subscriber, like we talked about, so email, but so it's funny how email has evolved. I've been using that subscriber hierarchy and for 10 years and but people are still, when we talk with a lot of creators, they're still focusing on their social followers. They're not focused on their email subscribers. And it's like, how do you move those over? So that's one thing. And then, of course, I had to move. Print was in for a while. Then it was out for a while. Now it's back in. <laughs> I have so hot AI has gone, you know, last couple of years, we've moved them in and out. But yeah, this, but the same, it's like, okay, well, I can keep these three and add these two or whatever the case is. But yeah, perfect something. I like it. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think what's nice is even if you saw, I've met, a, I've interviewed a lot of people who like they've blown up their TikTok or they've blown up their YouTube. And even then they're like, well, now what do I do? Oh, I need to funnel this into a newsletter. And for them, they may say, well, don't start with a newsletter because you don't have any people coming. They might say, start with a TikTok and then build your newsletter. Fine. Yeah. Either way, you're going to need it eventually. You're going to at some point need a way to hold on to these people. It, it's it's actually, I have no problem with people that said, hey, I'm starting out on TikTok or YouTube shorts or whatever. That's great because you know what? You're, the, an audience is already there. It's much easier to build an audience on those platforms. If you say, hey, tomorrow I'm going to start an email newsletter, it's crickets, folks. There's nobody there. You have to do a lot of work to get there. I remember Brian Clark and I, when he started his copy blogger newsletter, he's like, I got to do a lot of work on a lot of different channels to get people to go to that. So you have no reach there, but you have a lot of control. So it's almost easier to say, hey, let's. does it make sense to start where there's already an audience and then funnel them later to something like an email newsletter? And so that, that is a proven model that works really, really well. And as we're coming towards the end here, I, I just want to get a little bit of insight into your thought on events. I mean, there's different scale of events. So, I mean, we could be talking about workshops all the way to what you do. Sure. But- I'm curious when you think it's appropriate to build in some type of event into your your plan in general. So events, so if you're going to create event as part of your content business model, first of all, it's, it's very difficult to run an event. That's why a lot of people don't do it. But when, if you do it really well, it's an amazing differentiator. I mean, one of the reasons why at the Tilt, we started Creator Economy Expo, which is our new event, is... There were a lot of people talking about the creator economy, a lot of people talking about how to do how to build audiences, but not a lot of, of those brands were creating in-person events. And I said, well, maybe we can differentiate that way. And we have been able to do it and it's worked really well. Again, not easy to do. We got to, let's see, what were we at? We were at, at least 10,000 email subscribers before we started to sniff 
at the fact that we could do an in-person event. And when I said in-person event, I'm talking get 200, 300 people there, general session or multiple tracks. Like I would say, if you're going to get started doing a two-day general session event, no breakouts is fine. You know, you you do break a lot of uh, event coordinators do breakout sessions because you can have more speakers then and more speakers hopefully will attract more people. Uh, but do something that's close to you in your hometown. If you could do it at a hotel and not a convention center, you know, charge what you need to charge for it. But you got to remember, if you only have, let's say, five to 10,000 subs or maybe less than that, that's how you're going to get people to sign up. So you have to make sure you have lots of partnerships. So even we did this with Content Marketing World. We did it with Creator Economy Expo. We're like, OK, again, same question. Where are our subscribers? Where are our, the attendees that we will have? Where are they hanging out right now? Oh, OK, well, they're they're over at uh, okay, Creator Science with Jay Klaus. They're <laughs> over on Copyblogger with Tim Stoddard. They're over with, uh, with Justin Welsh, you know, whatever the case is. So we have to create partnerships with those people. We might have them speak then. We might have them promote out, those types of things. So that would be a really good way to start and say, okay, well, who are my top speakers? Do, do those speakers have an audience? Will they for, can I just do it by paying their travel? Will they be willing? And this is why you build a lot of relationships because then a lot of people are like, hey, I want, I want to help Brandon out. I'll do this there. I want to help Joe out. I'll go ahead and I won't charge him for something if he could just cover my travel and you can get something together. But again, where's the gap? If you're going to do it, where's the gap? If there's a lot of events out there, what's the, what's the thing that's not being covered in a certain way? So you have to have your content tilt with this just, just like everything else before you just say, oh, it's another SEO event. I mean, when SEO started to get going, there was 17,000 events. Today, there's just like three or four main ones, but like before. You had all these new ones come, then you had the same ones. So figure out what that differentiation area is, is going to be. Like Creator Economy Expo, we are differentiating because we're trying to get people to focus on the top of that subscriber hierarchy. If you want to lo- learn about how to build your YouTube channel or how to be the best podcaster, this is not the event for you. If you wanted to learn and say, how do I build a content business that I can be financially free and support myself? and do all the things I want to do in life, then CEX is for you. So that, that's kind of how I would think of it. I think that's a great strategy. I think we've covered a lot of different platforms and channels people could be leveraging and even the order of operations for some of that. So thank you for sharing that with us. Any other parting words as we go? And also let us know, we've only, we already mentioned a few of them, but where you like people to get to know you a little bit better. So it it is the best job choice I've ever made by leaving my corporate job and becoming a full-time content entrepreneur. But there's a lot of things that need to happen when you do that. So, I mean, the first thing is you have to be on the same page with your significant other. As as we know, most divorces happen because of fights about money. And when you start out this thing, there's not a lot of money coming in and you're spending a lot of money because you're marketing and you've got software costs and things like that, and you're not driving a lot of revenue. So you need to plan in advance. You could do this now if you've already started, but you can get your expenses down to as small as you can and focus on what you can and can do. And, and sometimes you have to take side projects. When I started, I was doing a lot of consulting I didn't want to do, but we had the kids were three and five years old. We had lots of bills. My wife wasn't working at the time. So we were, you know, we had, we had issues. So we had to do what we had to do. I'd like to say, go in and do that full time, but, but you have to be realistic about it. So I would, I would say, get your expenses down as far as you can and focus on being great at one thing. What's that one thing that you can do uh, that nobody else can do. And it takes time to figure that out. You might not know it, write that down and start figuring out what's that sweet spot. What's that content tilt. So really, really important. And then for this audience, for the stuff we've talked about today, the most helpful book is Content Inc. Epic Content Marketing is great. If you're a marketer, Epic Content Marketing. If you're a content entrepreneur, content creator, or wannabe, Content Inc. will help with that whole thing. And then as we talked about, Joe Polizzi, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I.com is where you can get all the stuff and it'll link out to uh, CEX and the tilt and everything else. But if you want to know about me, it's it's JoePolizzi.com. Love it. Check that out. Definitely subscribe to the newsletter. Sure. You know, 
even though it's not called random anymore, you're going to get a, a diverse group of thoughts, all that are definitely relevant for the creators out there. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate your time, man. And uh, it's been a blast. Yeah, thank you, sir. Keep doing your thing. And and I'm looking for, hopefully I'll be on again. Absolutely. And then I'll have two and Mark Schaefer will be one. Exactly. And then I'll have a one up on him, thankfully. I love it. All right. And thank you as well, audience, for listening and sticking with us today. I hope you guys found as much value in this conversation as I did. And as always, we'll catch you next time. You've just taken your marketing knowledge to another level with this episode of Brands on Brands. But we have plenty more ways to help you build a brand that matters. Head over to BrandsOnBrands.com for resources, as well as access to our blogs, videos, and exclusive coaching sessions with your host. Be sure to visit BrandsOnBrands.com.